I'm going to talk about life advice. You know, throughout life, you're going to have lots of times to give advice and to receive advice, right? I remember some of the first advice I received as a little kid it came from the movie Pinocchio, all right? Remember that? It's uh, Pinocchio is alive, and there's this kind of fairy or whoever she is. I don't really remember, but I remember her saying, hey, Pinocchio, through your life, you're going to have uh, some challenges, right? But it says, be a good boy, and you remember the rest? Let conscience be your guide, okay? At that age, I didn't know what a conscience was, right? So all I knew just, you know, be a good boy, right? That's kind of what I knew. Um, later on, I heard this word conscience, and it was like, you know, you have a guilty conscience. <laughs> so I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. How is a guilty conscience? You know, I'm supposed to be good, but I have a guilty conscience, and that's supposed to guide me? It didn't make sense. Uh, those are the things you kind of pick up, and you try to figure it out throughout life. Later on, you know, and today, we don't usually say that. We say things different. We, we talk about uh, following your heart, right? Uh, follow your heart. Um, your heart won't lead you astray. You know, just, just, just trust it. Follow your heart. But just in the same way, like, uh, you know, we, have a, we have a guilty conscience. Sometimes, sometimes our conscience is clean, right? Um, I remember going back to that. I remember this, like, after she said that, um, Pinocchio starts talking about it, and then Jiminy Cricket starts singing this song about, you know, um, staying on the straight and narrow, you know, and when you start to slide, uh, let conscience be your guide, give a little whistle, all that. It, but it, it's like, how do those things all go together? I have a guilty conscience, and I'm supposed to be a good boy. Uh, follow my heart. Sometimes my heart is really happy and joyful, but sometimes my heart is like I'm cold, uh, you know, I'm, I'm apathetic, you know, uh, I'm distant, I'm confused. We say these things, but then I, I come, I bring it to Scripture, and I let Scripture kind of uh, speak to me, and what does Scripture talk about the heart? In Jeremiah 17, it's a, a passage that many of us are familiar with, he, he spends a lot of time talking about the heart, and remember what he says about the heart? He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? He's saying, your heart is deceitful, it's a liar, it's a manipulator, Right? It's beyond cure. It can't be fixed. Who can understand it? Well, in the next verse, he says, here's who understands it. God understands it. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, uh, according to what their deeds deserve. And, and if you think about that, like he just said, the heart is wicked. Who can understand it? But I know it. I know the heart, and I'm going to reward it as it deserves. Okay, so that's good? Is that bad? Like, it depends on my heart. But Jeremiah just spent this whole time talking about the heart. And here's how he describes the heart. He says, here's the heart of men. You, are, you have turned far away from God. Right? You're stubborn. You're evil. You're rebellious. Your heart is heart, it's hard like stone. Right? You, your heart faints. It is broken. Not a very good description of the heart. Not one worth a good reward. And so we look at this, we say our hearts are deceptive, our hearts are wicked, we're far from God, but yet go follow your heart. Well, the good news is that as Jeremiah continues, he talks about this heart and he says, God is going to give us a new heart. He says in chapter 24, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, they'll be my people and I will be their God, for they'll return to me with all of their heart. He says later that you will seek and you will find me when you search with all of your heart. And so you have this conversation about the heart. And the heart doesn't start off good. It starts, it's wicked, it's deceptive. But God is working it out and he's, he's, he's shaping our heart and he's taking the heart of, as Ezekiel says, a heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh. So we stand here now today on this side of the cross. Many of us have given our lives to Jesus. We have a new heart. He's, he's given us, he's made us a new creation. He's put a new heart in us. But yet sometimes our hearts still become hardened. They still wander. We still doubt. We still have this, this heart that's just, uh, just broken and crushed. So what do we do with that? Do we just say, well, it's, maybe I'm not in the faith. Maybe, maybe I never was a Christian. Uh, maybe I have to work harder. Well, that's why we're studying this book. 
And that's what John is addressing as we study 1 John. John's looking and he realizes that there are people that are in Christ, but they're still struggling. Their hearts are weak. They are faint. They are condemning them. And he's, he's coming in and speaking to them and saying, there are times when your heart is fallible. Your heart is not always right. And at those times, you don't just throw away everything. We have to disciple the heart. You have to mentor the heart. And he, he do that oftentimes through the scriptures, through the truth. And so in this passage that we're going to be looking at today, there's three times that John says, and this is, is how you know. This is how you know. You ha- there are times where you have to, to use what you know in your brain, the truth that you've learned through scripture, and let it shape your heart. Let it speak to your heart. Let it guide you. So today, we'll look at 1 John chapter 3. And as we look at it, we'll see uh, these things that we are to know. That if we are in Christ, we are to know these things. They should be part of our lives. And we're going to take these thoughts, these truths, and let it work inside of our hearts. Let me read this passage. You can follow along. We'll read from 1 John chapter 3. And we'll start in verse 16. And it says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love not with words and speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him every, anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands and lives in, in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Heavenly Father, we pray as we study your word, Lord, that your word would speak into us. That when our hearts waver and when we struggle, let the truth of your word guide and shape our hearts to know the truth or that we would follow you each and every day. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at those three things. Well, let's see the love, how we have a heart that loves, we have a heart at rest, and we have a heart that is secure in Christ, knowing our salvation is in him. So first thing here, we know what love is, All right? We know what love is. Uh, there was a song from 1984 that asked this question. Any 80 rockers out there remember that song from Foreigner? I want to know what love is, All right? I remember that. Great question, right? Here's a guy who says, I just want to know what love is. I don't know if I truly know what it is. I want you to show it to me, right? That was his question. Good question. His answer that he gets is not so good. The answer is that this. He says, I want to know what love is. Love is what you feel inside, right? Love is what you feel inside. I don't know about you. I feel all kinds of things inside, and they're not always loving, (laughs) right? So good question, bad answer. But if if foreigner were to ask John this question, he would give them a total different answer. This is what he would say. You want to know what love is? This is how you know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of Jesus be in that person? Dear children, let us love not with words and speech, but with actions and the truth. You see what he says? This is how we know what love is. Sometimes our hearts struggle. We don't know what it is, and we're, we're trying to figure that out. But he says, this is what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Mic drop. Right? If I, I can't drop this. <laughs> but he could have ended it right there, and that's enough. You want to know what love is? It's Jesus Christ laid down his life for you, for me, for you. He sacrificed 
his life. It starts right there with Jesus. It, there's no other way to describe what love is than what Jesus did. He came. He left the thrones of glory. He came here to earth. Right? We were in desperate need. If we remember uh, our situation before Him, before He came into our lives, and when we read the Scriptures and we see the, uh, the story in the Old Testament of just the cycle of sin, right? We sin, we rebel against Him, all right? we, we deny Him, and then we come, we offer a sacrifice, and we're, we're made right with God, but then we sin again because our hearts, again, what Jeremiah said, our hearts are evil. They're hardened. We were in desperate need. We had this, this cycle of sin and then sacrifice, sacrificing the pure, the unblemished animal, uh, uh, forgive us our sin, but then the sin again and all, and all of that. And we couldn't break this cycle, but God out of his love says, I can break that cycle. You know what it's going to take? What we just sang. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So God sent his perfect son, born of a woman, born under the law, right? Born here, obedient to the heavenly father, tempted as we are tempted, but did not fall, right? He was the lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God without blemish. And he was led to the cross Jewish leaders, Roman soldiers took him there. Uh, that was all by design. That was intentional. Yes, he had the nails holding him to the cross, but it was the love of God that held him there. He could have called the angels from heaven and said, take me off of this cross and put those soldiers up here. But that wasn't the plan. This was the intention. He would come to show the love of God by being the sacrifice, laying down his life for you and for me. And I don't ever think that his life was just cut short, like he was in the wrong garden at the wrong time, you know? He went, shouldn't have gone there, shouldn't have gone down that street. This was intentional. He came to lay down his life for us, to show us the love of God. See where it starts there? I mean, he, he says, this is what love is. Jesus Christ down, lay, laid down his life. And then he says, you ought to lay down your lives for your brothers and sisters. But it starts with Jesus. He starts with Jesus. We love, why? Because he first loved us. Romans tells us while we were enemies, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He's the one that initiates love. He starts it. Right, so sometimes it's a temptation as we think, like, what is a good Christian? You know, oh, a good Christian, we should love our brothers and sisters. Yeah, for sure, absolutely, that's what he says. But remember, where, you, where do you start? What is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who has, knows how deeply they are loved by God. They know that first it's God's love in their life, that he came to them first. My life has changed because God has loved me. That's where we start. And then we can go and love others. But this is the love that he describes. John, I mean, look at all the words that he could have described to, to show God's love. He says, sacrifice. He gave his life for us, the ultimate sacrifice for us. And he says this, you have seen that, you have experienced, you live in that. And now go and live that same way. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Right? We, we, we see what he has done, and that ch changes our hearts. So now let us go show the love to the world through sacrifice. Uh, most of the time, it's, it's, it's not going to be that we have to give our lives for somebody else. Like Ultimately, it's, it's the day in and day out. It's just sacrificing uh, the things of my life to give to the others. It's sacrificing what I need to, so that others can, can live, so others can be blessed. It's living this life of sacrifice. All right? He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in, in, in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? He says, dear children, don't let us love with words and speech but actions and in truth. He, first thing he says is that as, as you, are, 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 you experience a sacrifice, your hearts are to be moved. 
Your hearts would be moved. He says, how can you see someone in need but have no pity on them? Right? The, the word pity, the, you know, it's kind of a weird word in our language. It means some different things. But really what he's saying here, kind of the, more the closer to the, the language, is anyone who closes his heart to somebody else, anyone who shuts down their emotions to somebody in need, says, how can you? How can you live that way? Understanding what Jesus has done for you, the sacrifice that he made for you. What he gave you. He says, man, let your hearts be changed. Open your hearts up. Look, look and see your brothers and sisters that are in need and see how you can care for them. How you can make a similar sacrifice. It might be material possessions, whether it's money or food or clothes and that kind of thing. Um, that, that's, that's important. But whatever we do, don't just shut your heart off to the other people. Listen, I, I know with with social media the way it is right now like you you can see every concern around the world in a second and our hearts can be so moved all the time and there's just a part of us just to survive we kind of have to shut things off like i know these are major things but we see so much back back in this day when he was writing they didn't know what was happening a hundred miles away let alone thousands of miles away but they knew what was happening right here in their in their cities in their towns and their homes and he says don't let your hearts become hardened right but open up your heart what god has done for you do that to others let them into your life and see what you have what god has blessed you and how you can share that with others that's love he says sacrifice through actions too right not just through words right i mean words are important he's not saying that words aren't important words are important and we've got to be uh, comfortable with using our words and sharing about the love that we have for others you remember how it is how the first time you heard someone say that when you're dating or you know you're you're married and you hear someone just say that oh i love you and it's it's powerful right let those words continue but he says don't let them just be words follow it up with the actions right let let the the, the words match our behavior, our action as we love other people. So when they're struggling and they're, they're talking about all those things in their life, don't just say, oh, I'll pray for you and, and hang up. Like, do it. Say, I know this is awkward. We're in a restaurant or we're on the phone, but can I, can I pray for you? Right? And, and how can we follow up? What, what can I do? Let's have lunch later on or whatever it is. I mean, you could apply this in so many different ways. But he's saying that you, when we talk about love, uh, it, it starts with Jesus. It starts with his sacrifice, but it should change us, change our lives so that we are moved by that. We have that same kind of compassion, that same kind of love for the people around us. You do that, and you, that, that is love. That's what answers that. If you are in Christ, you know what love is. You don't have to wait for the song to come on the radio. You know what it is. Jesus Christ has sacrificed for you. Now go and share that love with others. You know what love is. The second thing he talks about is rest. Right? He says that you know what rest is. You are in Christ. You should know how to rest. And it's not just how to take a nap. Right? We're talking about how, how your soul can be at rest. How you can have peace with God. We, even though we are in Christ, we still have a conscience that kind of, uh, you know, speaks pretty loud, right? We still have uh, these things in the, in the back of our minds saying, oh, man, you call yourself a Christian? Like, Chris, real Christians don't do that. Real Christians don't think that. And we have this, this conscience, this guilt, this heart that is so condemning on us. And just because we're in Christ, it doesn't mean we're immune to that. Right? So here, John is talking to people in his church. They have been struggling with this. They are hearing these things. Their conscience is heavy. It's, it's convicting them. And he's saying, but this is how you know you're at rest. What does it say in verse 19? This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. He talks about the condemning heart. He says, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And then he says, dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, 
we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and what? To love one another as he's commanded us. So he's talking about two things here, right? He says, this is how you know that you belong to the truth and how you set your heart at rest. I'm going to kind of, I mean, they're, and they're connected. It's the same answer for both of those. But I'm going to kind of talk about the first one in, in a few weeks. I'll talk about that when we get to chapter 5, right? Um, that we belong to the truth. But what I want to address is how we let our hearts be at rest and have peace with God. Because we're not perfect. Like I just said, we're not perfect. Nobody in here is. Even though we've been saved, even though we've been redeemed, we still sin. Okay? And we still have these things where we're like, I wish I didn't do that. Oh, I wish that wasn't a part of my life. But it still is. So what do we do with that? What do you do when your heart condemns you? Let's picture a courtroom, would we? In the courtroom, there's the, the, the judge. There's you. you. You are the defense right there, and there's the prosecution. And, and at that table, you, I need you to work with me here. Picture your heart, <laughs> okay? Uh, personify your heart. But you can wear dress in high heels or a mustache, whatever you want to do. But your heart is there, and your heart is, he's mad at you, right? Because your heart knows. He knows everything about you. And he said, you are guilty. Right? You are so guilty. You're a Christian. You say that you love Jesus. You say that your heart has been changed. But I am your heart, and I know. I see what you do. I know what you say. And he says, I have some exhibit. Exhibit A, right? You don't care for people. There's people in need and you don't care for them. And here's the picture. There's somebody in need and what do you do? You're walking by them and you just pick up your phone and you just pretend to have a conversation with your mom. So you don't have to talk to them. Anybody do that before? Hey, mom. Oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds serious. I'll get on a flight tonight. You know, just so you can avoid talking to that person like, I got something really important going on. You know? We do those things. We try to avoid. Like, you're not as loving as you think you are, right? Exhibit B, look at your bank account. Let's just, let's just scroll that up here. How much money do you spend on yourself, all right? You're given to all yourself, right? All those trips to Nordstrom's and all those other, you know, sporting events and all that. But where's, where's the nonprofits, right? Where's the money going to all those people in need? You don't give, all right? You're selfish. You're stingy, all right? Exhibit C, look at how judgmental you are. How many times you mumble to yourself about others being lazy and not working hard and all that kind of stuff. All these little bits of evidence your heart is thrown at you, right? And you're just like, yeah, you're right. I, I am guilty. That is me. I do that. I do that just so I don't have to talk to a neighbor. I pretend I'm on the phone or whatever. Like, I do those things. But just right then, right when the, the case is rested, the judge looks at you and he says, I got to ask you one question. He says, are you in Jesus Christ? Are you in Christ? You think that's a funny question to ask, but you say, well, yes, I am. I mean, I'm not. And he stops you right there. He says, you don't need to explain. If you are in Jesus Christ, then here's what I need to tell you. He reads this. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. If you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. You want to believe that, but you know the evidence. You know, you know that you're guilty. And you kind of just start to, like, judge, thank you, but I, <laughs> I am guilty. He says, no, nope. no. Nope. He continues to read from this book of the law. He says, who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one that condemns? The heart? No. Your heart? No. No one, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also, what, condemning us? No, he's interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. No one will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Case dismissed. You're free to go. See, we, at least I'll speak for myself, I, I feel like my heart condemns me so often. 
on what I do or what I don't do, right? But here's, and I could feel so guilty. I could feel so like, I, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. But then I hear God say, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Right? Who can condemn you? The only one who can condemn you is there sitting there praying for you, interceding for you. Is cheering you on. That's Jesus Christ. He's bringing your needs to the Father. So let your heart be silenced and hold to what you know is true. So the next time your heart starts yapping on about all the things that you failed at and all your failures and all your shortcomings, so you should be ashamed of yourself. You just tell them, you know what, it's true. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not there yet. But I am who God says I am. I'm a child of God. I'm a forgiven saint. I'm loved. I'm saved. And I'm at rest. Because the one person who could condemn me doesn't. He loves me. That's the truth. How can John say that? He, remember he says that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. That's a beautiful statement. That God is bigger than our hearts and he knows everything. And guess what? He still loves you. He knows everything and he loves you. That doesn't, sounds too good to be true. The gospel is, sounds too good to be true. Why? Because it starts with love. It starts with God's love for you. So that's why you can be at rest. That's why our hearts can be at rest. Because we have been loved by God. He knows our hearts. He knows all these things. And he says there's no condemnation. You are loved. You are part of the family of God. You're in the kingdom of God. You are in our family. You are loved. So we can be at rest for that. Now what does it demand? It does demand. It says this is the command in verse 23. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Right? We, we don't always like commands. We don't like rules. Right? But this is not the rule. This is because God has loved us. Right? We love him. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And here's what he says. This is my command, that you believe in me. Right? And who I am, that you believe in the name of Jesus Christ that he is the son of God, that he loves us, that he's given his life for us, that his death was enough to give us salvation, to save us, and to put us in the right standing before God. That's why we can be at rest. That's why we can be at peace for all that God has done. He has loved us. He's given us peace. The third thing here is we know what salvation is. We know what salvation is. Look at verse 24. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. The one who keeps his commands lives in him and, him and, and he in him. Uh, we've seen this through scripture at different places. We talk about abiding, right? Abiding with Jesus. Right, we, uh, John talks about kind of the, the, the vine and the branches. You know, they have to abide together to grow fruit, right? They got to be together. We talk about uh, the, the shepherd and the sheep. They need to live together. As they live together, the shepherd will take care of the sheep. But, but don't, don't go on your own. Stay together. Abide together. Uh, throughout, Paul talks about walking with, being in step, abiding with him. All of those things come together that when you are in Christ, you, you abide. He's in you. You are in him. It's hard to untangle those things. You guys remember like when you're little, like taking a nap with your, your mom and dad or your, your grandparents or maybe some of you have kids and you, you took a nap, you know, with them and, you're, and you get under the blankets and you, you know, you fall asleep and you wake up a little while later and like the, el the kids' elbows are, you know, gouging you in all the places that hurt, you know, but you, you try to get out, but you're like, you're all just tangled in, right? The blankets are all tucked in in every which way and you can't quite get out and you're, you're just there and it's, it's that, that kind of a feeling that we have. We, we are in him and he is in us. We're tangled together. We abide with him. 
That's not a great example, I know. I'll give you a worse one, though. I mean, it's just the, but it's football season, right? And we'll talk about football, and, and it is, it's as a whole abiding. It's like, it's like seeking that, that spirit. And the more I talk about it, the more I like this example is terrible. But the, the running back is running. He's running, you know, through the, the line, and the, the ball gets stripped, and it's, it fumbles. And what happens at the fumble? Then, you know, everybody just jumps on this because they all want to get it, right? The umpire comes, the referees, they start pulling people back, and, and I can just hear the announcers. Not that they would ever say it. They haven't ever said it. They never will. But they can see the, the, the referees are trying to see who abides with that football. Who has it? Who owns it? Right? And the umpire pulls up the guy, and he, you abide with this football. You get to keep this. Your team gets this football because you have it. You abide with it. We as followers of Christ, I told you that was terrible, right? But we have it. He's been given to us. That's why we know we are his. You have been given salvation. When Jesus says, no, there's no fumbling in salvation. Nobody will take this away. No one will take you out of God's hand. Nobody or nothing. You have it. You have the Spirit. You know what salvation is because you've been given the Spirit and the Spirit is working in your life little by little, shaping you to be more and more like Christ. That even though we've not been great at sacrificing to help others, even though our heart is not always full of compassion for others, little by little the Spirit is working and shaping us, opening our heart, letting us be more generous and more kind understanding more of his love, being a, a, a little hard, less hard on herself and not listening to those condemning voices, but listening to the words of Christ that say you are loved and you are chosen. Your future is secure. There are times when we are going to struggle. Right? Life is tough. And it throws, us, throws things at us all the time. And as much as we want to say, let conscience be your guide, you know, when you get in some uh, little trouble, just give a little whistle and things will work out. Like, that's not working, right? And as much as we think, like, just follow your heart, you know, our heart is not always our ally. Sometimes our heart is against us. So what do we do? We come back to what we know is true, the truth of God. We come back to this, and we say, I'm going to let this speak into my life. Who am I? If I am in Christ, I am a loved child of God, because he sacrificed for me. He showed me his love. Right? I'm at rest with him, and I'm secure in him. That's the end of the story. And so, friends, um, if you are in Christ, these things you know. These things are true of you. You're loved. Let, you, let be at rest. Don't get so worked up over where we're not. We're not there yet. We're going to get there. The Spirit is at work because you have the Spirit. Know these things. But let me say this. Some of you, if you say, I am not in Christ, then these things are not true. But they can be. If you are not in Christ, if you've, if you've said, no, I've never given my life to him. I've just tried to, you know, be a good person. I just let conscience be my guide. Um, that's not going to be good enough. What you need is Jesus. You need to give your life to Jesus because he gave his life for you. And just say, Lord, I've tried. I've not been successful. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you all my sins. All these things that I thought I was doing good, the earning me favor with you, it's not. It's not working because it comes from a deceitful heart. I mean, what I need is a clean heart. Lord, would you take these sins and would you give me a new heart, a clean heart, one that, that desires you? And will you shape that to make it like Christ? If you pray that, if you want that, that's your reality. And so you don't have to ask, what is love? You will know love is through Jesus Christ. And what he has given to me, I'm going to be at rest and I can be secure 
in my salvation. I want that for you. I want that for everybody here. For some of you, you've already done it. You're good. Others, you're wondering, would you pray that? Would you trust him and just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you my heart. Lord, show me love. Give me rest. Give me salvation. Today is the day. Amen.